Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and others. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and this week our very special guest is Jilmata Villanova Mitchell. A little bit about Jilmata. For almost two decades, Jilmata has been helping organizations and leaders become more effective and inclusive through her engaging diversity and inclusion professional learning sessions, leadership development programs, and equity and cultural proficiency coaching. She is the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at IMT Insurance, and she also supports our clients as a leadership coach. Jilmata has worked with HR managers, chief diversity officers, and other leaders to create more inclusive work environments. She, create, she collaborates with organizations private and public, helping them create strategic plans, create equity-driven monitoring tools, create more inclusive cultures, and learn more about equity-driven leadership. Now, here's some fun information. She's originally born in Brazil. She moved to the United States in 2001. She holds a Bachelor in Multicultural Education from FUMEC University in Brazil and an MSE in school at the School of Counseling at Drake University. And she has a focus in her doctoral studies in organizational behavior with a focus on trust in the workplace. I'm so, so deeply excited for all of you to meet my dear friend, colleague, my mentor. I I mean, there's so many descriptors for you, Jilmada. And um, so welcome to the show, my dear. Thank you. I'm so, so happy to be with you today. I, I'd love to take a moment to talk a little bit about how you, our paths crossed, because I think it's a fun, <laughs> I think it's a fun, it's a, it's a love story that almost never happened because of it me. Is, it is, <laughs> it is. So I was going through a divorce and I was doing some soul searching and thinking, what do I want to do with my career? And I started looking online for people who are doing we're doing work with leaders that had more of an interpersonal focus. And I found you. And so I thought, well, I th- you had just started your company and I had never heard about you. And I thought, I'm going to sh- send her an email and see if we can get coffee. And then you answered me after a couple of weeks, I had sent you a message and you said, let's meet in four months. And I thought, well, <laughs> that's a long time down the road, but that's fine. So I was talking at the time with uh, different people and I was anxious I was anxious to talk to you because I, I felt you were the one who were on the same mission I was to make the workplace more a little more inclusive, uh, healthier, uh, more meaningful to people. And then we finally met and the rest was history. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> and to be clear, like I wasn't in high, I, you know, <laughs> I, she, she, you know, she, she had reached out. Uh, <clears throat> my first year, everything was a hot mess. I was disorganized, trying to figure, <laughs> trying to figure <laughs> out the business, and 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 quite frankly, being a little overwhelmed by the number of inquiries I was getting about people wanting to meet for lunch and 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 have, which is is really sweet and. And I was saying yes to so many that it became too much. And when we finally met, it was like, oh, you're no, you're really incredible. <laughs> and 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 we we, you know, it was sort of love at first sight. It, you know, we were talking similar language. We had a lot of similar values. And then we just continued to have conversations. And I, you know, because because of where I was when I first started, uh, I and, and I think this is a good indication and an introduction to Jilmada is um, I, I hadn't brought on anyone else to do work with me yet. And part of that was because I was still figuring things out. But part of it, too, was there was, you know, when I met Jilmada, I was I told her we had lunch and I said, I I'll be honest, you're so amazing that I'm afraid no. That I'm, I'm like not going to be able to live up to what you bring to the table, and and the fact that I could even have that conversation with her, and the fact that we were able to talk about that, and and what would a partnership look like? That it wasn't just a oh hey let's work together. Um, we spent a lot of time having deeper conversations with each other, and and um, and you know that was a turning moment for me of like. Oh, we have to find a, a like we have to find a way for us to work together. 
Um, yeah, these conversations have been, they have been super important for me. I knew when I was, uh, when I was going through my most challenging time that talking to people who were on the same mission I was, was what was going to make me stronger. Hmm. And you were one of those people that was brought to me in a very, uh, in a very weird way and made a huge difference in my journey, figuring out how I wanted to elevate the work I was doing. So I feel really fortunate our crosses, our paths crossed because yeah. you have made a huge difference for me. No, likewise. And, and I'm so excited to, to, to dig into this, to our conversation today. Before we, before we talk about, so, so for, uh, so one of the things that we want to spend some time on is uh, talking about how do we disagree more effectively? Why is it important to be able to create cultures, not even at, just at work, but in relationships, um, where we can honor different perspectives, where we can share that? Um, that that's a place we'll start, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. But Jilmada, what, you know, when, whenever we read the formal bios, right, there's a lot of formality to it. What else would you like the audience to know about you? I would like for the audience to know that I am a mother, that is a role in my life that I love and I feel like it's a huge part of who I am. I have two incredible daughters. I uh, enjoy learning from them and they should keep me on my toes, you know, with little kids. You just, you're always being challenged to grow and learn. And I love that about them and what they bring to me. Um, I have an amazing partner who is uh, a person who has made a huge difference in my journey too who is super outside the box thinker and always challenges my um, inclination to be in my safe spot, you know, and I, I have been really fortunate to walk this life with him and <clears throat> that I am, I love people. I love mm. people. I think that people make life better and the problems we are facing today as a human family are complex or uh, difficult or puzzling and we can't do it alone. So hmm. I think people have become more and more important as we try to figure out solutions for the problems we're facing today. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, one of the things for those of you who eventually or maybe already have been in conversations with Jilmato, one of her absolute superpowers is the ability to create sort of almost it feels like instantaneous connections with people through her conversations. I, you know, there's there's been a number of times where, you know, you've been in moments and you're like, oh, and it was just such an easy conversation. And it was like, you know, because because you do that like that. That's the role that you play. And I always Thank marvel. Um, I marvel at your ability to, you know, because you're able to step into a lot of times really uncomfortable conversations in a way that is is genuinely rooted in curiosity is genuinely rooted in compassion but also also doesn't shy away from saying you know what i have a different perspective on that and you do it in a way that's so incredibly disarming and so so one of the things that i'm curious about is just to paint the picture of you know, what, what was the journey that brought you to this place of this work that you're doing, the what you're so passionate about? And also, you know, what shaped you? Um, what shaped you and how you show up when you when you are in conversation and connection with humans, because it, it is really a marvel um, to witness and to experience. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I, I went to school to be a lawyer. And I was a good student. I thought that that would be a good fit for me. And then when I was finishing my law degree, I decided that that wasn't what I wanted. Mm. And <clears throat> the reason why I decided that was because I wanted to be able to be very spontaneous in how I did my work and interacted with people. And I felt limited by uh, some of the structures that the law profession puts in place. And so I... At the time, I was teaching part time and I was doing that as something that, you know, a, a, a job while I went to college. And I loved it because kids were so spontaneous and they were so real. And that is something that's really important for me. So I went back to school and I got a, a degree in education and then I moved here 
And my education degree was fully validated, which was the one I was really interested in pursuing. And I started teaching in Des Moines and I was 25 at the time. And I started becoming really interested in the psychology of learning mm. and how what allows for people to learn and how can we learn at our best and how do adults learn well. And so I went back to, to school and I got a, a, my degree in counseling. And that degree has been so valuable for me in doing my work because I feel that mental health and well-being is such a huge part of the workplace nowadays. And mm. with the tension and the pressures we have, we cannot treat that as an add-on anymore. It's a, a key element of a healthy culture in a workplace. And so that has helped me uh, greatly understand people, understand what motivates them, uh, be able to be a sounding board for them when they are struggling and spinning, when they need a little bit of... Uh, encouragement or a really uh hard push you know and mm -hmm. i i then started becoming interested in counseling and i spent every saturday at a library a heartland area education library that it's a, an agency that serves educators in iowa and they have they have lots of books and i always love to read and so i spent my saturday mornings there and one day they offered me a job I said, sure. I said, I'm here all the time. I'll take the job. And I didn't know what the job was. And it was to coach superintendents and be a leadership coach there. And I was I was grossly underqualified for the <laughs> job, but I took the job. So I went from teaching first grade to coaching, you know, leaders in schools. And I decided when I started interacting with them that they were really curious about my background as an immigrant, as a woman mm. of color, a person who had an accent. And I decided that I wanted to help them understand what our experiences were and serve families and students like me better, create systems that really served underrepresented families and students. And so I went to my HR person at the time and I said to her, I want to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And keep in mind, that was 20 years ago in Iowa, nobody was talking about this. And I said to her, can you create a position for me that does that? Because I don't think I'm your person for this other position. <laughs> and she said, absolutely. What do you need? And she created this wow. position for me. And so I learned as I did the work. And I have been learning for 20 years. And I had uh, quite a ride there with you know, helping school leaders create better systems for all families. And then I uh, started doing some consulting. I wanted to do some consulting in other areas, healthcare, financial uh, organizations, uh, IT companies. And then I met you and we started collaborating. And I uh, saw a job posting for IMT to be the director of DEI. And I loved how they wrote the job. I loved their core values. Mm -hmm. It really aligned with my personal values. I applied for it and they hired me. And here I am loving each minute of this uh, opportunity and trying to, you know, make an impact at IMT and uh, my personal coaching and consulting as well. So I love my job. I wake up excited. I know that the inclusion issues we have won't be resolved in my lifetime, mm -hmm. but I want to be sure that in the next 20 years I have, I will make a dent at uh, making the workplace better for people. Mm. I, you know, and <clears throat> no doubt you've already made such an impact. One of the, you know, one of the things that you, you know, that you brought into to our conversations and, and into my world is, is this idea of we, we need to be willing to speak up, speak out, have differing opinions. And, and not that I ever thought that having disagreements wasn't important. I knew that it was, but there was something about how you always, you know, you always label this whenever you're working with a group and, and invite this and encourage it, but then you always role model it. So, and, and, you know, and obviously I'm <clears throat> really passionate about helping people who might avoid stepping into those conversations, who might get nervous or not know what to do. Why, why is it important, Jilmata, for us to be able to build up that muscle to be to be able to say, you know, I disagree with that or to receive when somebody disagrees with us? 
You know, uh, that's a great question. I came from a culture where we are very indirect communicators and disagreements weren't part of my upbringing. And then I landed in the Midwest where it isn't either, right? right. <laughs> because people are very polite and nice and they, they, they equate disagreeing with uh, unkindness. And so mm. they have this stigma around disagreeing that I noticed right away when I arrived. And what I have learned, Sarah, is that when we love somebody and, and love the project we're working on, we have to be brave enough to show up in a real way, mm. out of love for that individual, for that project, for that decision we are making. And when we just pretend we are green and don't show up in a real way, we are robbing that person an opportunity to grow to be challenged in a productive way and to land the best decision for the organization. And so what I did to, to, to start learning how to love disagreeing productively was I stopped seeing disagreeing as being unkind. And I started seeing disagreements as a springboard for, for new ideas, mm. for growth opportunities. And, and that's how I look at disagreeing. And I think you can, to me, disagreement and productive conflict are tools to build trust with people. Because when I show up in a real way and I speak my truth, people know they can count on me to be sincere, to be honest. And that adds to the work we're doing. And it, it brings us closer when it's well done. And so that's what I have found that uh, those moments are moments where we can capitalize on getting closer and building trust and being very kind as we share a different perspective, a different opinion, or a different idea. And to me, uh, diversity is difference, and uh, difference of perspective and thought is hugely neglected mm. as seen as a diversity component, mm -hmm. and it's one that people often struggle with. Yeah, there's 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 a number of things I want to highlight, and I I so appreciate. This is why I love you. I so appreciate how you set that up from the standpoint of when when you love someone, when you love something, then then one of the ways to honor it is to be real. And you know, and you shared that and, and in not doing that, it robs the organization, it robs the other person. And I and it also can rob yourself of speaking speaking up, offering your perspective, maybe asking for what you need in a way. And that, you know, and that's something that we can see, especially, you know, I mean, I, I speak from a Midwest perspective, because that's where I'm born and raised. And that's, you know, while we work with clients all over, we still work with a lot of clients, is that that in that moment of of not speaking up, resentment can come in, bitterness can come in. And now this relationship that's important to you is is starting to erode. And we don't even realize that the reason it's starting to erode or have an incision is because we, we weren't being real with them. You you know, and 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 your your language of thinking about it as a springboard for new ideas. I mean, what a beautiful reframe. Um to say, okay, like, I'm going to say this so that we can potentially create something even better. Uh, what, you know, what's your sense from the work that you do of, of um, what do I want to ask? I have, I have so many questions that are coming, <laughs> coming up for me. So I'm trying to like funnel one. Um, when you when you are, are working with people, how, how do you start to role model or help them start to step into that space of of being more real of being more because okay yeah here's the point that 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 moment of trust when somebody says I and mean, this again this is something I really appreciate about you is I know that you will always tell me you know what Sarah I actually I have a different perspective on that or I disagreed with some of the things that you were talking about there and I always appreciate it. And I find myself now because of our relationship and, and, and paying closer attention to that. When I don't have that in a working relationship, I start to actually distrust the working relationship because mm -hmm. I wonder, well, what are, there's no way we can agree on everything. 
There's no way that everything you're okay with everything. So what what might you be holding back? So how how do you start when you're working with a group or an individual um, to help them start thinking differently about that? So that's a great question. First thing I do is I model that in the way I interact with people. So I feel that a lot of times we we believe our ideas become our identity. Mm. And when we are challenging ideas, we feel a personal attack. And when you become skilled at disagreeing and having productive conflict, which is my goal for every team I work with, because I think that's a that's an element of a high functioning team, we, uh, we are able to do that in a way that affirms the person, validates mm-hmm. our relationship with them, but pushes back on the idea. So mm. this is not an attack on your identity. This is a tr- a, an attempt to land at the right idea. And we see our belief system and our ideas as true and as, uh, as the monitor for how things should be done. And in reality, they're just what we have been used to believe, but it's not true or better. There is mm-hmm. no value that we can place on our belief system, on our ideas. And so the way I model disagreeing is I first start by saying, I really care about our relationship. You matter to me and the way you see things it matters to me. However, right at this moment, I'm not with you. I have a completely different perspective and take on this topic we're discussing. And I'd like to offer that. Are you open to listening? Mm. And so the first thing I do is validate the relationship and how important that human being is for me. And then I go full force on sharing how I am seeing things differently because I do believe that when we can, when we, and my measure, my measurement for how successful I was in having conflict or disagreement is, did I leave this room closer to that individual than I came in? Mm, mm. If I did leave the room feeling a stronger connection, I know I did that well. Mm. But I, I have found in my life that the times that I have disagreed the most and the people who I can disagree the most with, um, that creative tension leads to growth, leads to better outcomes in decision making, leads to innovation, and it leads to uh, trust. And so, you know, the benefits of becoming skilled at disagreeing with respect are great. What a what a powerful question. You know, I'm always listening for where the where the little moments of practice or tools, you know, to to reinforce and even just thinking about when reflecting from a conversation, did we leave closer or didn't we? And 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 again, to get curious about it. And that's that's part of evolving. It's part of, you know, building our self-awareness. And, and I think that's that's such a powerful question, especially if your realization is, oh, no, we we actually left further away. And now what, what, like, am I okay with that? Or what am I going to do to, uh, to bring that together? You know, you spoke about, <clears throat> you spoke about the trap of essentially confusing, disagreeing with being unkind. You spoke of another trap of, uh, of, um, confusing our ideas with our identity. And that's something that I definitely, have observed and and witnessed. I know some organizations will say the minute you share an idea, it's no longer yours. It's just it's on the table as an as an idea. And I think that when we when we don't have cultures of of having real conversations, that's part of what can make it feel so personal. Because it's almost like we we because we aren't used to it, it feels sharper, potentially. Um, than it actually may be in the moment. Um, what are what are other, perhaps if there are, like what are other things you've observed or witnessed that maybe holds people back from engaging in more real talk of saying, hey, you know what, I, I have a different perspective. Um, yeah, I'm just curious to, to tease that out a little bit more if there's anything mm-hmm. else you would add um, to that. Yeah, I think that one of the things I have observed quite often is that we go into work meetings thinking and believing that the goal is to agree. And Mm. so group thinking kicks in, social conformity kicks in, and we are not doing our best thinking. We're walking on eggshells. We are having superficial conversations and we are not feeling real 
which is miserable. It's a miserable way of leading your work life. And um, when we come with the goal of listening differently, of listening for what surprises you, what startles you, uh, then you embrace things completely different. And and honestly, Sarah, in my journey to elevate the conversations I have with my colleagues, I have had like I have found three three resources that have been very life altering for me. One is conversational intelligence, which you also love and mm -hmm. uh, use. I I have after I read that book, I look at every conversation I have each day with a different uh, lens and I elevate the importance that they have because I know at the end of the day, our brains might be different. Our neural pathways are going to be different based on how that exchange happened. And mm -hmm. so I want, and time is our most precious resource. It never comes back. This hour we're spending together today will never return to us. Money you spend and you make more, but time is not possible to get back. And so I want to use every minute I have with people in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to be walking on eggshells. I don't want to be walking on eggshells. I want for us to be going deep and, and changing as a result of our interactions. And then the other resource that has had a profound effect on my career and my life is uh, Margaret Wheatley. I love her. Mm. When, when September 11th happened, she pu published a book in 2002 called Turning One to One Another. And that book made a huge difference in how mm. I saw my conversations and my interactions with others. Uh, but she just talks about how our life today has become really weird, really strange, really puzzling. Uh, the problems we have are complex and we need each other more than ever, but we forgot how to talk. Hmm. We always have all these structures, all these structures around our conversations that we don't need. All we need is two people and a, a, an intention to make something magical happen. That's all we need. But we find these apps and this minute taking and all of these artificial structures that limit, in my opinion, how natural the exchange is. Yeah. And then the other one that I really find <clears throat> has made an impact on me, um, you know, as I think about disagreement and conversations is Julia Gallif's work. She does a lot of work about uh, rational uh, decision making and bias in thinking, cognitive mm. bias. And uh, with her, I've learned how to look at disagreement not as an uh, identity uh, attack, but really an idea improvement. And so uh, and having that scout mindset and thinking, you know, what else could be happening here? Not coming and coming with the intention to say, I was off, you're right. Being proud of saying I was totally wrong. You know, mm. I don't see that happening a lot that people say, I totally think your idea is better than mine. You know, we right, should do what right, you're right. Uh, no, I we're both. Totally <laughs> but we're real. We're real. We're real <laughs> eager to think and to say whether we say it out loud or not. See, I told you so. Yeah, boy, that that does that feel yes. so good. And and what <laughs> and what a powerful, you know, like those. I I I think that's an it, it's an interesting thing to think about. How how often do you observe? How often do you witness at work in your home life in your own how you show up? Do do you see the phrase? you know what, you're right. Or I hadn't thought about that. Or yeah. hmm, my thinking's changed on this. Or yeah, I was wrong on that. Or what insert whatever. And that I mean, that's such a core of intellectual humility. And then yes. right? I mean, it's just that willingness to, you know, people who have been following, right, our work for a long time know that curiosity is such an important anchor. Because because curiosity isn't just asking questions. It's this, it's this it's this understanding that there's always things we don't know. Yes. <clears throat> there's things we don't know about ourselves. There's things that we don't know yet about other people or a situation. And and how beautiful. I I I, I love moments. Now I don't always feel com it's not always comfortable. <laughs> but I I love moments when someone really changes my mind on something. And it's mm -hmm. like Oh, I hadn't thought about that. But to me, it's a gift 
because now yes. I see differently. Now I can think differently. And it and again, it's not always it's not always comfortable. I want to go back to okay. So first, for those of you who were maybe frantically writing down all of those great books, uh, we will put those in the show notes as a resource so that you can check those out with links of where to purchase. But I, I want to go back. I don't know that I've ever heard you say this. And I, I, I circled it, I squared it, and I put a couple of stars by it. <laughs> that idea that how often, especially at work, we think the goal is agreement. And, 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 and that made me think of, one, or, or like the, the, the constructs, the, c- the container we're trying to keep the, the conversation is, needs to be so rigid that then the conversations become transactional, when a lot of times conversations need to be transformational. We need to be sharing and discovering. And, um, and I just, I want to explore that a bit because I think that's a really, really important uh, place of reflection for people to go, uh, how often are we coming into this saying we need to agree? Now, obviously we need to get clarity so we can move forward. We can't just be spinning our wheels constantly. One of the things that we see in our work, and, and we frame it through the lens of there's technical problems and then there's adaptive challenges, right? Those technical problems are those things that have an obvious single solution, you know, that we can fix and solve with our current expertise, our current authority. But then we have adaptive challenges that are messy and complex where the problem may not even be clear, there might be multiple problems that are contributing to it. And then that means there's not a one size fits all solution. You know, when you think about work like inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that that's not a technical fix that we go, hey, let's just all agree on how we're going to become more inclusive, and then we're done. So I'm, I'm curious to just hear more about your experience of what you observe or see, or where that comes from that 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 sort of desire to let's get to agreement quickly. Yeah. So that we can move on. Mm-hmm. So when I when I start working with a team, the first thing I watch for is how many people are saying, I think about this differently or challenging the ideas, bringing their own perspective. Is there group thinking taking place? Um, how, how comfortable are people saying I was wrong? You were right and proud of being wrong and changing their mm-hmm. mind about something? Uh, is there pride involved in uh, growing or mm. or or the work is to defend my own idea because that is uh, my identity and I need to affirm myself because I don't feel safe, you know, and uh, questions. I think in groups that are high functioning, in teams that are really high functioning, you hear more questions and problems yes. so- than you hear more questions, good questions and solutions. There, there are people who are in this journey asking good questions and sometimes saying, I don't know the answer mm-hmm. to this because we are trained to be certain and confident. Mm. We are not trained to say, I don't know the solution for this, but we together can figure this out. Um, we don't feel comfortable saying that because we think our credibility is going to be questioned. And I think in reality, when you are very upfront about what you don't know, and you're opening the door to exploring that in a curious way, you land in much better places yeah. than decisions, you know? And so I, these are the three things I always observe for. It's, um, is, is it disagreement? Uh, are there any disagreements or uh, are questions being asked and are people saying, I don't know? And are they curious? And are, um, are people comfortable saying, I was wrong and giving mm. somebody else a chance. But the goal, in my opinion, is never to agree. The goal is to commit to something, even if you disagree, but you mm. understand the angle that the team is taking and where they're coming from. So sometimes I enter into a conversation knowing that my perspective on something is completely different from somebody else's and that I'll never agree with them. However, my goal is to increase the respect we have for each other, even mm. when we disagree. And bring that person in. We Nowadays, we tend to uh, remove everybody who thinks differently from our circle, our inner circle, because we feel we can't respect people who bring a difference in thought. And I think that's a mistake because we need people in our inner circle who sees things completely different from us, who 
have a different filter for how they capture information and inputs. And I think we are horrible at embracing people who are uh, who see things from a different perspective than us, you know. And, yeah. and when we understand that we don't have to agree with the person to respect them or to be close to them, life becomes a lot easier. Mm-hmm. What would you, you know, what would you say to situations where perhaps there's, because I can appreciate, I could imagine there might be some people listening to this going, yeah, but there are some things that are just non-negotiable for me, right? Whether that's uh, intolerance or hate or whatever, what, you know, when, when in your perspective, and there, I don't think there's, there's a one answer to this. So as I'm, I'm processing this, but like, you know, when are there times when you may need to set boundaries of, of, of what that looks like? Or what's your perspective on that when maybe it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe somebody is saying something hateful, let's say, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the boundary for me happens when it becomes a personal attack. Mm. So, you know, as long as it's about ideas, anything is, 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 uh, is okay. I think that when we are discussing ideas and affirming people, Everything goes in a respectful way. Now, when it becomes disrespectful and it becomes an attack to somebody's identity Mm. and who they Mm. are, and it's not safe, that's when I uh, think it becomes unproductive. And so uh, as long as we are not, uh, you know, talking about people in a way that it's demeaning, that it's uh, disrespectful, I am okay with uh, difference in talk. But I think when it becomes insulting, disrespectful, and about the person, not the idea, then is is when I draw the line. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And, you know, there's something I want to go back to. I want to go back to that, the example, because I know a lot of the people who who listen to this are either in leadership positions or are, uh, you know, whether that's from a a business uh, unit perspective or from an HR perspective, that that prevalence of teams not asking questions is pretty sick. That's that's always something that I'm looking for as well when I'm when I'm observing is it's not just are is everybody taking turns and sharing their ideas but are we are we clarifying are we you know to use the conversational intelligence tool are we double clicking are we saying hey when you said that what did you mean by that or where you know like what were what were your thoughts on this and sometimes sometimes what i observe in in some teams um and 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 and, and there can be um um what do I want to say? A misdiagnosis that the team is functioning high because there's not this high conflict, right? Like, um, but you know, just taking turns sharing ideas is still not as effective as I feel like that's feedback that I'm often giving teams is I don't see you ask ideas, like you don't ask questions of each other. You don't yeah. clarify, you know, so, you know, let's, let's, I want to really build that muscle of how can we, how can we ask more questions? Um, not for the sake of asking questions, but really building that curiosity muscle and not, not assuming that you know exactly what they meant when they said this. I think that sometimes, sometimes we miss opportunities perhaps to offer a different nuanced perspective or just opportunities really for deeper, deeper understanding, even down to the language. Hey, you know, Jelmada, when you said X, I don't know, when you said that transparency is really important or to be real is really, let's use an example from this conversation. What did you mean when you said to be real? What does that look like for you? Because so often what I've experienced in my life and observed is we, we can be saying the same words and operating from totally different meanings, mm-hmm. operating from totally mm-hmm. different d- definitions. And so that, you know, that idea of where, where, where can you get more curious? Where can you clarify? Where can you deepen? And, and then that's a beautiful entry. And again, I, this is something I, 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 I thank you for because I'm much more intentional now about making sure that if I'm feeling a, well, I have a different perspective on that to just say that. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes, sometimes getting that clarity helps me understand where, where are we? 
where are the differences in our ideas so that we can clarify, see where we're similar or see where we're different and then have a conversation about that. Um, so I'm really, really glad that you brought that up because, you know, it's, I think when we talk about trust on teams, sometimes we go about thinking about building trust in a superficial way, in a shallow mm-hmm. way, instead of, you know, it's sometimes it's these moments of disagreements that actually when done well, right. Um, and that doesn't mean it will be comfortable always, but when, when it's respectful, that's actually what can bring a team closer together or can bring a relationship yeah. closer together. I totally agree. And I think sometimes it's because it's why people feel miserable at work is because they can't speak their truth mm. and they can't, when you are hanging out with a friend, you feel great because you're not walking on eggshells. You know, you can mm. be who you are, you know, you can put your freak flag up and it still feels strong sense of love and belonging but at work for some reason people lose that and then they are counting the seconds to go home because then they can talk like they want and share their mind and their opinion is valid and i think that we need to bring that back to our meetings you know the idea of i'm gonna show up bringing my own perspectives and making mistakes i mean i uh, we are all imperfect we will mess up The conversation Mm -hmm. is not going to be smooth and perfect at all times. And that's fine. As long as we can say, can I have a do over? I'm sorry. I I didn't say that the way I meant to. Can I say that again? You know, or I was wrong. You were right. Your idea is better than mine. People in my book, when they say that, the credibility I have for them grows immensely. Yeah. Yeah. That. That you, uh, so if anyone read has read my book, I talk about the do over and I credit you for that because that that Mm -hmm. was a gift that you brought to our work and to to my life is that idea that sometimes we think one that everything has to get wrapped up into this pretty tidy package in a single conversation or that right it has to be perfect or that it has to all be clear and we're you know it's it's kind of the whole expect just uh, expect non-closure right Uh, and and we're humans and we're imperfect and there are times we might not say the right thing or we you know or we don't realize we said the wrong thing and how powerful it is to simply just ask Hey, I I need a do over and a do over is not necessarily like I want to do over so I can like really fight my point even more clearly Mm -hmm. and make you, you know, you, you less and me more, but it's a, it's an opportunity to repair. And I I will tell you, Jill Mata, that, that practice when, 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 when I've introduced that to the clients that we've worked with, or even in personal relationships, there's always this response of, can I do, I can do that. It's like, Yes. And you and you mm-hmm. should, especially if the relationship is is important to you. What you know, um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. But for people mm-hmm. who are like, so ha- what? What can I say if I have a different? You know, if I if I disagree and I'm you know sitting here going, I want to do this. It makes sense. I'm on board. What What are some phrases that people might consider that would be non confrontational ways to just uh-huh. offer up perspectives? I would say <clears throat> always start with saying. I really respect how you think, validating the other person and saying, you know what? I am not with you right now. I'm seeing this Mm. completely different. Can you give me a chance to share how I'm seeing this? Um, So the the formula I use is I always affirm the person and ask permission to share a different perspective. Because Mm. if you ask for permission, the person is fully emotionally prepared to embrace that in a positive way or in a in a way that it's productive. Sometimes it's not positive, but productive. Mm. I, one of the things I have been on a mission to change at the workplace is positive, uh, toxic positivity. Mm. You know, when things are hard and the discussion is heavy and everybody's coming in with a heavy heart, you've got to embrace that and say, you know, this is darn difficult. We are going to spin today, but we will respect each other as we do that. And we will be super honest if we need a break, if we need a do over, if we're not saying things in the way that we intend, if we're hurting other people. And so I think that pretending things are not happening and lightening mm-hmm. up the mood sometimes, the mood sometimes is not helpful. You've got to say, this is going to be a tough conversation. 
I want to, to show up emotionally prepared. I want for you to know that if we need a do-over, if I say something in a way that I don't mean to say, I will let you know and you can let me know. And if I need a break, if I get overwhelmed, I will let you know. And, you know, setting up those conditions before you have the conversation helps a ton. Mm. And the other thing is sharing your intention. So oftentimes when I'm going to have a really difficult conversation that it's tense, I'll say to the person, here is where I'm coming from and why I'm doing this. I care mm. about you. Mm. I care about our relationship. And I care about how we collaborate. And right now, I'm feeling you're hoarding information. Mm. So that is making me a little bit um, less productive. And I would like to understand what's going on for you. Am I causing you to feel like you have to hoard this information? How can we improve this collaboration? And so I think that... Uh, Sharing the intention up front, affirming the person and asking for permission to share your perspective when it's very different helps a lot. Mm. You know, and then I always thank the person after the fact. I always say, hey, this was tough, but you know what? I'm taking this away with me. I learned this mm. from you today. And we didn't get to where we wanted, but the process was beneficial for me because I mm. feel closer to you than I did. And I understand now where you're coming from, you know. That, um, you know, I was I was thinking as you were talking that that a, a, a lovely compliment I've received is oh, I just want a Sarah on my shoulder when I have these conversations. And, and as you're talking, I'm like, I just want Jilmata's all over my shoulder. <laughs> just like, say this, <laughs> you know, like a Cyrano de Bergiac, like, Sarah, <laughs> say this in this moment. Because, you you know, because, because, and, and what I, what I, what I think is so important is that it's, people can go, well, of course it's easy for you, Jilmata. But the reality is, like you set it up, it wasn't. That wasn't the culture you were raised in. That wasn't how your family may be communicated. And these are muscles we can build. I mean, I, you know, I always jokingly say I'm a reformed avoider, an in progress reformed <laughs> avoider, depending on the mm -hmm. moment. But that these are these are muscles that we can build and and these really beautiful practices that you just shared of affirming the person, affirming the relationship. You know, when we talk about affirming the person, it isn't saying, you know, I appreciate you, but I think your idea is dumb. Like that's that's not what it is. It's it's an and it's a it's an expansion. It's, you know, I just want to reiterate how important this relationship is and 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 how much I value. And I don't I don't I'm I don't see myself in that. It, you know, we I interviewed uh, Dr. Nika White, and that was an example she gave is that. She sometimes she'll use the phrase like, I don't see myself in that example as a way of like somebody who's a woman of color can speak to mm -hmm. when they're talking about. And, and, and it's and it's this beautiful entry. And so thinking of it as an and I think is a way also that allows us to expand it. Um, mm -hmm. And then that asking permission to share, because you know, one of the things that I found is when you ask somebody, would you be open to hearing my perspective or I have a different perspective? Are you open to it? Most people aren't going to say no. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say, no, I don't want to. Now, maybe yeah. if it's a situation where they're struggling and you're like, I have a perspective on how to help. Do you want to hear it? Maybe they go, I'm just not ready for that. But, but and if most, they're not, it might as well not share, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and the other thing that was coming up for me as you were talking was just this, like, how do we get our self-efficacy back? How do we build up our agency, right? And, and encourage other people to, to build up their agency. You know, when you were sharing the example of, of entering into a difficult conversation that maybe is heavy, just acknowledging that and, and also maybe honoring, hey, and if you need to take a break or do what you need to do to take care of yourself, like, let us know that. I, th I think that, you know, again, we have these patterns, we have these patterns, especially in the workplace, right, of that either we things can't get too heavy, they can't get too hard, they can't get too close, they can't get too far or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, and so I mean, those moments when things are hard and we navigate it, when we can come out of it and say, yeah, I, I know that wasn't easy, but I'm glad we had the conversation and I'm glad you and I can have that conversation. And, and I'm sorry, one more thought, just because you were just saying so much. 
But that acknowledging after a conversation is a practice I rarely see. Like that is a that is a practice I know I'm personally committed to doing in my own relationships and helping other people to because it reinforces that we can have these kind of conversations. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, sometimes too, Sarah, I, I look to see how people describe conversations and opportunities to converse with others. And a lot of times they use like war terms to talk mm. about conversation. Mm. They'll say, I'm going to fight for this idea today. Mm. I am mm. going to bring an army to defend this idea. And it's all war related Mm. and the way you're coming to the conversations it's with a war mindset and a fighting mindset and that kind of vocabulary doesn't help us uh, elevate the importance and the relevance of our exchanges with each other and so when we look at every conversation as a gift and an opportunity and people know they are loved and they're cared for you can push back as much as you want they will encounter you and push back again <laughs> to you. And it's going to, and it, it really, it's going to unleash the the potential we have when we come together. Mm. But we just, we just look at it through some lens or not helpful, I think yeah. sometimes, you know. No, we, I mean, I, the, w- the way I always talk about it or think about it is, don't prepare for the conf- confrontation, prepare for the conversation, right? Because that's what yeah. happens. It's like, well, we have to attack it. Well, you just got, I mean, this is why I don't like the phrase, well, we just got to call it out because it's often like the elephant. We just got to call out the elephant in the room because that's often said from such an aggressive place instead of a yeah. place of exploration. And, and, and again, that, I mean, it does take intentionality, but it's not impossible. And, and it's so, it's so magical. Like you said, it unleashes these possibilities because we just can get better ideas and we will build better relationships. And, and, and so that's, I think that's an interesting um, thing for people to think about is what's the language, whether you say it out loud or not, even if you think it, what's the language in your head when you're entering into conversations that might be feel hard or uncomfortable or disagreeing and what's the language that people are using in your organization and how is that perpetuating it's you know it's like i i i i have the belief that if i'm coming into a conversation from a win lose mindset i've already lost right yes. like i might win maybe i win quote unquote this point but like i've already lost because i'm not i'm thinking about this in terms of a competition i'm thinking about this in terms of a mm-hmm. confrontation instead of a moment to collaborate with this amazing human in front of me and to yeah. create something better yes i totally agree with that jomada you uh, there's so there's so much I have so much, but we're coming to our, the end of our time. Our podcast could be three hours. You well, so this is, well, so I will say, you know, I, and I share this, there's, there's, you know, I feel like there's this, this short list and you're, you've always been on that, <clears throat> but you know, to just, I, here's what I would say uh, uh, for people who are listening, we, we, we do intend to have multiple conversations with people. So Jilma, Jilmata will be back. There might be times where I'm going to have her host. You don't know that, but I'll like, I'll, <laughs> I'll share that with you down the road. But, you know, where she may be a guest host interviewing somebody. But if there's something from this conversation that you're curious about or that you're um, maybe has become clearer for you, certainly, uh, you know, reach out to us. And, and that's something we can explore in a future episode or we can follow up with you. Jilmata, as we wrap up our time, you know, I want to give you a moment to reflect on the conversation. And I love this. I love asking this question. And I hope for those of you uh, listening, also think about, well, how would you answer this? And that is, you know, conversations, we know that conversations change our worlds, right? Um, What is a conversation either that you've had with yourself or with others that has transformed you? And you can share as much or as little as you might want related to that. Hmm. I have had so many. It's really hard to pick one. But uh, I think I'm going to share one that I had with myself when mm-hmm. I was going through my divorce, which I consider one of the most challenging experiences I have uh, encountered so far. 
I had a conversation with myself. I was terrified and I was um, worried about several different things. And I had a conversation with myself <clears throat> saying, the way you navigate this change and this transition in your life will teach your girls the most important lesson mm -hmm. they will ever receive, which is how to navigate challenges with grace and with, uh, with hope that things are going to turn out well. And I thought to myself, they're watching you. Mm -hmm. And this is your chance to teach them this most valuable lesson that they will have challenges in their lives. We all do. And how do you want them to look at these challenges? And if they look at me and they see that we are struggling, but we will be okay, they'll be okay. And, and so I uh, kept that thought in my mind throughout the years I was, you know, getting back on my feet and navigating some difficulties. And that has helped me immensely with them, with how they felt about it, and with teaching them that life is tough. We have to be prepared to respond with grace and dignity, even when things are pushing you to the limit and making you terrified. Hmm. So that was one of the conversations that was a turning point for me. Hmm. Thank you for and deciding sharing that. how I was going to tackle that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Jilmata, I have no doubt that people will want to either follow you or connect with you after hearing this, or at least know that they have that as an option. What is the best way people can connect with you? I am really bad at uh, keeping up with social media, as you know. <laughs> so <laughs> feel free to share my email, Sarah. Okay. They can always send me a message. I have a LinkedIn account that I am pretty active at. But other than that, I just love talking and exchanging in person, virtually, and uh, on a more personal level than, you know, on social media. So if they want to reach out to me, email or LinkedIn is the best. Perfect. And we'll share we'll share both of those links in the in the show notes. Jilmata, I love you. And I'm so I glad you too. were patient with me all those years ago and <laughs> didn't didn't give up because I It was worth the wait. <laughs> I'm so I'm so I'm so glad and thank you for sharing your absolute just um really powerful wisdom. I know there were some things that even I took away and went, Oh, this is the first time I've heard her talk about this in this way. And I think I needed to hear that. Um so I have no mm. doubt that um, people are leaving this conversation a little bit more curious and hopefully a little bit more courageous um, to be to be their real self. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me and for being such a positive influence in my life. We are so good for each other and I am so happy for your successes and how you are making an impact in uh, the lives of the people you serve and you know, work with. And I'm proud to be your friend. I'm proud to be your colleague. And I'm mm. humbled that I was here with you at this hour. Thank you, my love. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations. I very much enjoyed talking to my dear colleague and brilliant, brilliant coach and leader, Jilmata Villanova Mitchell, about how do we how do we bring difference of ideas and perspectives to the table? How do we disagree productively? There, there's always so much that I learn from these conversations, but I think I think one thing that I'm really sitting with is how can I continue to celebrate, not just internally, but externally when there's been a growth moment because somebody changed my perspective? I think that's something I want to work on is being really intentional about saying, you know what, I was wrong, or I, uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. And I, I think there are definitely times when I do that, but sometimes it it stays internal, and I want to be more external about that. Um, also, that idea of just how often we may enter into conversations with the goal to agree. That was uh, particularly powerful and provocative for me. And we want to we want the conversation to extend beyond the show. So if something resonated, if something sparked a curiosity, maybe you have a challenge or a different perspective, please share them with us. And, uh, and we may we may share them on the show, uh, your comments on the show, or we may use it to inform a future episode, you can send that to us at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com, or you can reach out to me through social media. 
And if you want to support this podcast further, please consider becoming a patron by visiting us on patreon.com backslash conversations on conversations, where not only your financial support will sustain this podcast, but you'll also get access to some pretty great benefits like swag and Patreon only content and events. And if you haven't already, please rate, review and subscribe to the show. You can do so on iTunes, Spotify and other podcast platforms. This helps us with our exposure and our reach and continues to sustain this podcast. Also, if you are looking for or interested in how to have more powerful conversations with yourself and others, check us out at sarahnollwilson.com. Or again, my DMs are always open in all social media platforms. It might take me a minute to get back to you, but I try to get back to everyone. Also, you can pick up my latest book, Don't Feed the Elephants, wherever books are sold. I just want to give a a thank you to our incredible team who makes this podcast possible, to Drew Knoll and Nick Wilson for the editing and producing of the show, to Olivia Reinert for transcription, and Caitlin Summit Nelson for marketing support. And a final, final thank you to Jill Mata. Jill Mata is somebody who has shaped me personally, professionally. She has profoundly changed how I think about leadership. And um, and I'm just so grateful that we were able to spend this time together and, and all learn from her wisdom. So thank you, Jill Mata. And a final reminder that when we can change the conversations that we have with ourselves and others, we really can change the world. So take care, everyone. Be well. Please make sure that you are resting and rehydrating. And we will see you again soon.